Houndoom, good stats, especially attacking stats with the speed to back them up. And it only really has low defense. It's got a cool design. Look at it. It's so ferocious and has an awesome demon tail. Also, it's an incredible typing because dark and fire pair together really well. Generation 1 didn't pair the fire type with any types other than flying, so it was really exciting to see Houndoom as a kid. But in true Game Freak fashion, they made this awesome new Pokemon so hard to obtain. In Gold, Silver, and Crystal, Houndour can only be obtained in Kanto on Route 7 at night time. This is the route right before Celadon City with one patch of grass that in Generation 1 has like Pidgeys and stuff like that. Also, the Gen 1 games trained you not to look here, so like, yeah, I never did as a kid. Also, Houndour has a 5% chance to spawn in Gold and Silver. At least they realized this and were probably like, well, we should probably make it a little more likely to see a Houndour here. They raised it to 20% in Crystal. So that's really nice, but yeah, I'm sure many of you never used this Pokemon in Generation 2. Because Halloween's coming up and this is one evil looking doggo, I figured that now would be the best time for my first attempt with it. To make things as hard as possible on myself, I replaced Cyndaquil so that the rival picks Totodile. I nicknamed my Houndour Doom Hound because I have a stupid inside joke with my fiance where if a Pokemon's name contains two words, I reverse the ordering of them. Uh, for example, uh, Talonflame becomes Flame Talon. I think she cringes a lot every time I do this, so yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, and I'm also sorry to you because <laughs> now you have to deal with it. Let's move on and talk about dark types and how they were treated in Generation 2. First, we should examine how Game Freak treated the Steel type, which was also introduced at the exact same time. They added cool new evolutions for existing Pokemon like Steelix and Scissor. They also retroactively added the Steel type to the Magnemite line, dramatically improving its battle capabilities. In Generation 1, this line was sort of meh, like it's good on the Champions team but nowhere else. But in Generation 2, it truly becomes a defensive beast. Also, it's worth noting that Steel-type is one of the best defensive typings in the entire game throughout the whole series. However, with Dark-type, they decided to not add it to any existing Pokémon in the Kanto decks, and so every Dark-type there was is brand new in Generation 2. We have Sneasel, Murkrow, Houndour, Houndoom, Umbreon, and Tyranitar. Interestingly enough, the only mono dark type that was introduced is Umbreon. Now in Generation 2, all dark type moves are special attacks. So Pokemon like Sneasel got it very bad being a physical attacker that has two types that deal special damage. Like that poor thing. Murkrow is overall not particularly strong despite being a balanced attacker. Umbreon's very defensive. And of all of them, Houndoom really got it the best. It's paired with the fire type, which is another special type. And its stats synergize so well with these typings. Also, it gets a great move pool. It starts off with Leer and Ember and learns Bite, Faint Attack, Flamethrower, and Crunch through level up. So it gets all the best Dark type moves and one of the best Fire type moves. Through TM and HM, it learns Sunny Day, Solar Beam, Iron Tail, Return, Shadow Ball, Mud Slap, Sludge Bomb, and Fire Blast. Of course, it has access to the standard moves like Headbutt, Curse, Toxic, Hidden Power, Return, and Swift. Granted, I don't think I'll be using these normal moves too much today, specifically because its dark and fire type moves are just fantastic. It's really refreshing to know that I'm not going into this with like return and headbutt, because those moves are just so centralized in the meta of Generation 2 runs. For the first rival battle, I did some training, which took a decent amount of time because unfortunately Houndour has a major downside, and that's that it has a slow growth rate. Oh, I also forgot a berry in this fight, that's not good. However, the rival's Pokemon hasn't learned any elemental moves, so this shouldn't be too bad. Plus, the fact that I got a burn early on in the battle really helped. That lets me take a quick victory and I head back to the lab, where I tell the policeman the rival's real name. After that, I head north to Violet City and catch myself a Bellsprout along the way so that I can use Cut and Flash later in the playthrough. Now, an advantage that fire types have in Generation 2 is that they can train quite quickly early on against the Bellsprout in Sprout Tower. This is important because Faulkner's coming up next, and his birds know Mudslap, which is super effective against both Houndour and my patients. So with Sprout Tower out of the way, let's see how this first gym battle goes. Houndour is level 12 and Faulkner has a level 7 Pidgey, but you really shouldn't underestimate it because it can get annoying very quickly. Ember doesn't quite one hit, come on, like it would have been nice if it just did, it survives on red health. I wonder if level 13 over the damage rounding threshold would have allowed me to knock it out in one hit. Probably. 
He goes for Mudslap, of course, lowering Houndour's accuracy, which isn't actually a guarantee in Generation 2. There is a 1 in 256 chance for Mudslap to not have a secondary effect. I miss my next Ember as a result, but my third one takes the bird down. Pidgeotto's next, and because it knows that it gets Stab on Gust, it's going to go for that for more damage against Houndour. The problem here is that Ember misses one too many times and Faulkner finishes me off. The next fight plays out very similarly, and I get my accuracy lowered twice. If only my second Ember had just hit, I'd have more accuracy for the Pidgeotto. I miss turn one against it, then Ember hits and does less than half, so I think that's it. However, my second Ember gets a critical hit and Pidgeotto goes down. So that's a really lucky victory. I will definitely have to test level 13 for my second playthrough. Faulkner gives me Mudslap as a reward, and while Gligar, a ground type, cannot learn this move, Houndour, a fire type, can. Thanks, Game Freak. I teach it right away because the ability to lower accuracy could be clutch in tough fights. I run into some wild Pokemon heading south and I knock them out so that Houndour learns Smog by level up. I don't think this is going to be particularly useful, but I'll teach it just in case. You'll also notice that I deleted Leer instead of Roar, which if you're familiar with Generation 1, seems like a terrible idea. However, Roar could be useful against Bugsy if his Scyther comes out and starts to set up Fury Cutter. After all, Roar forces the opponent to switch, and then it will break his combo. In the cave, I'm not quite as stealthy as I wanted to be and the spinning hiker catches me. Oh well, his rocks have terrible special defense. Then in Azalea Town, I pick up Repels and head into Slowpoke's Well where I defeat the Rockets. At this point, I have avoided most optional training since Faulkner, and that's because I think Bugsy is going to be quite easy. He leads with Metapod, and I go for Ember, which takes it out in a single hit. Cocoon is next, and once again, Ember gets the one hit. Scyther's last, and it uses Fury Cutter, which does a small amount of damage. Ember does almost half, and then it misses a Fury Cutter. Okay, so I've got this win now. As predicted, Bugsy wasn't an issue. Next is the rival. He leads with Ghastly, so I go for Mudslap, which does half, and the Ghost Lick does one damage. <laughs> and then I knock it out. He sends in Crocknaw next. Oh no, I'm only one level higher than this thing. Then it crits with Water Gun and takes Houndour down to 11 hit points in a single turn. My doggo eats its berry, which probably won't be enough, but it is enough to survive the next hit with one hit point, but that's not enough to win. So unfortunately, I can't go back in time and fight the trainers in Bugsy's gym. Would have been really nice to do some training there. Instead, I'll have to backtrack through the cave, and the first trainer on my way is Hiker Anthony. Let's defeat his Pokemon. Well... <laughs> Apparently I can't, because his Geodude does so much damage to me with Rock Throw. And then it survives my second Ember on a Sliver and takes Houndour down to 4 hit points. But still that's not enough, because the following Machop uses a super effective Low Kick for the knockout. Alright, I feel like I'm starting to get walled here. I decided that maybe facing the rival again might be good, just in case I got lucky, but yeah, it's a terrible idea. Croconaw just knocks me out again. So what's the solution to this wall? At level 20, Houndour can learn Bite, so I might as well train and get that. I backtrack through Union Cave, defeating all the trainers I skipped on my way to Azalea Town. At the other side of the cave, I continue my training, and then once all the trainers are defeated, I have to grind in the wild in Johto, which is always a painful experience. Finally, Houndour learns Bite, and now I'm ready to take the rival on again. Please let this do more damage to the Croconaw. At very least, it's able to take the Ghastly out in a single hit, so there's no more chance that I get paralyzed here. But how much will it do to the Croconaw? It does what looks like half, and then Bite's 30% chance to flinch activates and Croconaw can't move. My next hit knocks the Croconaw out, and I'm moving on to the Zubat without taking a single hit. I take it out with Bite, and that's it for the fight. So this fight went from pretty much impossible to extremely easy as soon as I got Bite. In the forest, I grab the TM for Headbutt and teach it to Houndour immediately. This is a great physical move, and it also has a 30% chance to flinch. I think we're going to be seeing a lot of flinches in this run. Then, in Goldenrod City, I get the bike and head into the underground where I give Houndour a fancy haircut. Please love me, that will make return better. After that, I buy myself an Abra, and then north of the city I fight some trainers. After all that, I talk to Floria and head back to the gym using Abra to teleport. Now here's the thing about Houndour and its evolutionary line. It's really lucky because while it has a slow growth rate, it does evolve at level 24. Like, it would have been truly cruel of Game Freak to make this thing evolve at like level 50 or something like that. Like, ah... I would have been so angry. <laughs> I was really hoping that the trainers I defeated to this point would level it up enough to evolve before Whitney, especially because her mill tank has rollout, which is super effective against fire types. 
I defeat all the gym trainers to give me as much experience as possible, but it isn't quite enough, so I have to head back north and defeat a few more trainers to push Houndour over the level it needs to evolve. While this evolution does increase its stats, it has one consequence, which is it makes moves like Flamethrower and Crunch take longer to learn. However, I think that the raw power is worth it right now. Whitney leads with Clefairy, and I go for Bite. It almost knocks it out, and Clefairy goes for Metronome, which could select something like Parish Song. It has happened in the past, but in this case it selects Disable, and so yeah, I can't use Bite anymore. I knock the Alien Fairy out with Ember, and Miltank comes out next. Now, Rollout isn't the most accurate move in the world, but I don't think that I can two-hit the cow. So, I use Mudslap first turn to hopefully mess its combo up. The first hit doesn't do that much, and in the moment, I was thinking that maybe the additional accuracy drop would be more consistent, so I went for Mudslap again, Rollout hits again, taking Houndoom under half, and then I click too fast and I accidentally use Mudslap for a third time. Okay, Whitney, you really need to miss. Miltank does, breaking its combo, and then I use Ember, which takes it to orange health, and in a stroke of luck, it also burns. Because of this, Miltank's attack is halved, and it can't do very much to me on the next turn. So, Houndoom knocks it out. In Ecrotake City, I face the Komodo Girls. This is like the one area in Johto where the experience yields feel appropriate. Everywhere else, you just get no experience. Next, I head to the Lake of Rage, and I'll mention the Hidden Power type that I selected for this run. I thought that Hidden Power Ice would be the most beneficial because it helps Houndoom against Dragon types specifically. But, for now, I don't need that because the next battle is the rival in Burn Tower. First is Haunter, and Bite 1 hits. Next is Croconaw, and Bite does do more than half, and it strikes back with Water Gun, which strangely enough is the only water type move this thing learns throughout the entire game. My next Bite takes it out, then Bite finishes Zubat, and Ember melts the Magnemite. Okay, that was easy. In Morty's Gym, I face all the trainers for some quick experience so that I can level Houndoom up as much as possible. Something I've always found with Ghost, Psychic, and Dark types is that they're in this like weird type triangle all off by themselves. They don't really seem to interact with the rest of the type chart. I've actually seen Wolfie VGC talk about this too. In this case, Dark resists Ghost type moves, and so I'm really not worried about this battle. The only issue here could be the Gengar, which puts Houndoom to sleep. However, Bite just gets the one hit and I knock it out, so yeah, that was a quick victory. Now, while I run errands in Olivine City, I want to mention a strange fact about Generation 2. In these games, whenever you defeat the gym leaders, their badges give certain types boosts to their power. For instance, after you obtain the Zephyr badge from Faulkner, all flying type moves that your Pokemon use get a 12.5% boost to their damage. The type that a particular badge boosts is related to the type of that gym leader, so Morty boosts the power of ghost type moves and so on. This has a very unfortunate consequence for Houndoom. Because, to obtain a fire boost, it needs to defeat Blaine in Kanto. Yeah! Also, there are only 16 badges, and there are 17 types. So guess which type doesn't get a boost? Yeah, the dark type. You'd think that maybe once you defeat the Elite Four, they'd give you a dark boost. After all, Karen is a dark type user. But yeah, they didn't do this. So sorry, dark type. You're actually just the bad type in these games. It feels like Game Freak really wanted to convince children not to be evil, which I guess is good, like, good job. But right now it's Halloween season, and uh, we have to be evil. Just so you know, the power displayed in my moveset listed in the top left is dynamic, and it includes type effectiveness, the same type attack bonus, and item boosts. But right now, it does not include the type boosts from the badges. However, since filming this video, I have added that to the calculation, so in the next Johto video, the type-based badge boosts will be accounted for. It's worth noting that these type-based badge boosts aren't the only badge boosts in Generation 2. So, for example, after you defeat Faulkner, the Zephyr badge gives your attack stat a 12.5% boost additionally. These boosts are already accounted for in the stats that are displayed in the bottom left. There is actually a badge boost glitch in Generation 2, which relates to how the special attack and special defense boosts are calculated. I'm going to mention it now because there's this boring rocket hideout stuff that I'm taking care of. Like, ugh, this stuff is so, like, mindless. When I get Price's badge after all this, it gives a boost to both my special attack and my special defense. Well, uh, at least that's how it's supposed to function. In reality, there's some messy coding which causes your special defense not to be boosted when your special attack stat, the unboosted special attack stat, is between certain values. 
So yeah, watch my stats when I defeat Price. Watch how my special attack goes up and my special defense doesn't change at all. This is the glitch. In order for my special defense to get a boost, my unboosted special attack would have to be between 206 and 432. But for now, my special defense is just my saddest stat. Next is Jasmine, she leads with Magnemite, and Amber gets a one hit. Okay good, no Thunder Wave this time. Then she sends in Steelix. Despite this being a ground type, it doesn't know any ground type moves. Amber does more than half and it goes for Rock Throw, which does so much damage. Oh, that's because it got a critical hit. Luckily Houndoom survives, so it finishes the Steelix off and cleans up the following Magnemite. I finished the mid game in this order so that Houndoom would gain as much experience before it had to face Chuck. I did consider giving it Hidden Power Psychic just for him, but overall I think Ice is better. As a consequence of this, I'm going to have to face Chuck without super effective damage. And I also had to walk around the overworld a lot before I head over to the island. Inside the gym, this Hitmonlee does so much damage with Double Kick, and then it follows with a Jump Kick which almost KOs. Houndoom ends up surviving on two hit points. The problem is now not this trainer, it's his friend. Hitmonchan fights me next, I don't have a chance to heal. Remember, one of my rules is that I cannot use items in battle, so that allows him to finish me off. That's my fourth reset today. Instead of trying that again, I decide to do some training. I defeat Yusin, and then I fight some trainers at sea, leveling Houndoom up to level 38 over the next damage rounding threshold. This way, I can two hit the Hitmonlee, because of that I'm able to finish off the tag team trainers, and then Nob that follows isn't a threat. Now, it's time for Chuck. Primeape is first. I choose Headbutt just in case it causes a flinch. It doesn't, Primeape uses Leer, and then I knock it out. Time for Polyrath. Once again, I go for Headbutt hoping for a flinch. I don't get it, Polyrath uses Dynamic Punch, but of course, it misses. That's how Dynamic Punch is supposed to work. I go for Headbutt again, maybe it'll flinch this time? Nope. And then Polyrath actually hits a Dynamic Punch, doing more than half. Okay, come on. Because this move always causes confusion, Houndoom hits itself, and then in the luckiest event ever, Polyrath hits a second Dynamic Punch, and that finishes Houndoom off. While I try this fight again, I'm going to mention something about Dynamic Punch, which is that I said it always causes confusion, but that is not entirely true in Generation 2. It actually has a 1 in 256 chance to fail, just like Mudslap. This time, Primeape does a little bit of damage with Karate Chop, so I'm arriving at Polyrath a little bit bruised. Because Headbutt didn't two hit, I can use Mudslap first turn to lower Polyrath's accuracy. Yeah, go on, try and hit a Dynamic Punch now. And Polyrath is like, okay, and it uses Mind Reader, taking aim. Here's the thing though, remember Headbutt that just wasn't getting flinches before? Let's try it again. And this time, I get a flinch and knock the Polyrath out. Okay, that is really satisfying. Now, it's time for the rest of the rocket plot line. Before I get into that, I head to the department store and I pick up the TM for return. Then, I buy some calcium, which is great in this game because it raises both your special stats. That's because special attack and special defense actually share the same DV and the same EV, what's actually stat experience in these games. With these new buff stats, I defeat all the rockets in the radio tower, and then in the underground I face the rival. Once again here, for alligator, steel only has water gun. Yeah, it's terrible! Houndoom has learned Flamethrower at this point. It's really nice to have a better fire type move other than Ember. Like the only thing I would criticize about Houndoor and Houndoom's moveset is that they don't get something like Flame Wheel in between Ember and Flamethrower. With the Charcoal and the same type of attack bonus, my fire move is now doing so much damage and it's typically going to be the move that I want to use. It's at this point in the playthrough that I'm starting to realize a nice synergy that the fire and dark type have together. It seems that you can almost always deal neutral damage to your target with one of your two stab moves. Actually, are there any types that resist both fire and dark? I don't think so. After defeating more of the rockets, I pick up some more vitamins and then I finish off the rocket admin. Oh, by the way, the pairing of fire and dark resists both fire and dark, so yeah, there's one case. On my way through Ice Path, I grab the Never Melt Ice, be great with hidden power, the rest TM, which is my favorite, and then PP up, which always helps. Now, it's time for Claire. I give Houndoom the Never Melt Ice, of course, to boost his damage by 10%, and hopefully this is going to let me avoid Thunder Wave. Being paralyzed would be very bad against her ace Kingdra. She sends it out second, and here, return is going to be the best move. 
It does half. Kingdra uses Surf, dealing half to Houndoom, and then I knock it out. Because of the damage range with Hidden Power, I one-hit the two following Dragonairs, and that's another easy win for the Demon Hound. I answer some questions, pick up some rare candies, and then I pass through Victory Road, battling my rival for the last time on my way. Sneasel's first, sorry Houndoom, is uh, just the better dark type here. For alligators next, it still has Water Gun of course. <laughs> oh, this thing's so bad. Golbat follows, but unfortunately it moves first and uses Confuse Ray. Uh, wait, how did this thing move first? It's level 36 and Houndoom is level 47. I really don't get it. Oh, that's because my speed got lowered. That's not nice, but I should be able to one hit, right? Wait, are you kidding me? I hit myself twice? No, three times? As a result, Golbat uses Wing Attack and finishes Houndoom off. I cannot believe that I had a reset against the rival here. He's usually so bad. Without the speed drop, I move first against the Golbat and knock it out right away with Hidden Power. Flamethrower dispatches Magneton and Faint Attack 1 hits Haunter and Kadabra. Okay, that's more like how it's supposed to go. Now I've made it to the league. Reflecting on the run so far, Houndoom has struggled against the rival and some random trainers here and there, but it hasn't really struggled against any major battles. It did lose against Faulkner and Chuck, but only once each. The question is, will it struggle against some of the League members? Hopefully not Bruno. Will is first. He sends in Zatu. Because it's the Psychic type, Faint Attack knocks it out in a single hit. Alright, are all of his Pokemon going to be one hits? His ace Zatu certainly is. Then Flamethrower knocks Executor out. Okay, that was a critical hit, so I got lucky there. Out of any of his Pokemon though, the one that has the highest chance to survive is going to be Slowbro. I go for Faint Attack, and it's a one hit! So yeah, that's it! Jinx is last, it's Frail, and Flamethrower knocks it out. That was an incredibly easy victory. And while Koga is supposed to be a Poison Master, chronologically this game comes after Yellow, so he's actually a bug trainer now, I don't think that Houndoom is going to struggle here, so I don't even save before I go into the fight. After all, if I can get away with avoiding saves, then it'll reduce Houndoom's overall time. He sends in Fortress, I use Flamethrower and knock it out in one hit. Muck next, and it's his only mono poison type Pokemon. I go for Flamethrower, it does more than half, and Muck turns itself into a tiny little star. Looks like the Star Trek logo, actually. As a result, Flamethrower misses, Muck poisons Houndoom, and my Flamethrower just keeps missing. Now, at the very start of the video, I mentioned that Houndoom does not have particularly impressive defense. Yeah, currently it's the only stat that isn't in triple digits. So Muck hits with Sludge Bomb, and it does so much. The following damage from Poison, followed by another hit from Muck, finishes me off. I am really regretting not saving after Will now. It was definitely a miscalculation to assume that it would be easy to defeat Koga. At least Will isn't a grueling fight and I can quickly knock his Pokemon out again. After defeating the Rockets in Radio Tower, I picked up the TM for Sunny Day, and so I figured I could teach it to Houndoom now to boost its damage a little bit against the Muck. Eridos is pretty weak after all, so it's perfect to set up here. Unfortunately, Muck still survives, he uses Minimize again, and the boosted evasion doesn't save it this time. All that's left is Crobat. Interestingly enough, even though Hidden Power Ice is super effective, Flamethrower is still the better move. That's because I'm holding the Charcoal, and I get the same type of attack bonus with it. I do miss once because of double team, but it isn't enough to save Koga's Crobat. It goes down. Oh, I guess he does have one more Pokemon left. How could I forget about it? It's my favorite, Venomoth, the fighting water type. However, today clearly the type effectiveness calculations are all broken or something because Flamethrower just knocks it out in one hit. So, we've made it to Bruno, and he's a new addition to the Elite Four in Generation 2. His lead is Hitmontop and it really loves to use Dig first turn, so I set up Sunny Day. It does about a quarter to Houndoom and then I knock it out with Flamethrower. Hitmonlee is also a one hit, but Hitmonchan has priority Mach Punch, which does a lot. That's really not nice. Now I only have orange health left for the Machamp, luckily Hidden Power can knock the Onyx out right away so it doesn't get a chance to set up Sandstorm. And now it's time for Bruno's Ace. I go for Flamethrower because after all it could cause a burn and lower his attack but instead it gets a critical hit and knocks Machamp out. All right, I'll take that luck. After all, the next fight tends to be one that I regularly get unlucky in. I made a mistake right before Violet City because I forgot to pick up the Bitterberry, so I won't be able to cure Confusion if Umbreon uses Confuse Ray. Luckily in this fight, it uses Faint Attack. Why? I don't understand. So I knock it out the second turn. Next is Murkrow and Flamethrower finishes it off. Then Karen sends in her Houndoom. 
So yeah, this thing resists all of my attacks. Pretty unfortunate. However, I am going to be able to knock it out over time because it can't do anything to me either. I was realizing at this point that maybe faint attack wasn't the best to keep. If I kept bite, the 30% chance to flinch could have been helpful here. However, since Umbreon does no sand attack, I wanted faint attack for the added consistency. Not really sure which one's better, but either way I'm moving on. After faint attack 1 hits the Gengar, and flamethrower 1 hits the Vile Plume, that is. Now, it's time to face the champion Lance. First is Gyarados. This might be the scariest Pokemon on Lance's team for Houndoom. I use Faint Attack and unfortunately it doesn't quite do half. Gyarados sets up Rain Dance and then because Houndoom is faster I can use Sunny Day. This removes the rain and additionally cuts water type moves power by 50%. This is a great choice because Gyarados is going to use Surf this turn because it's thinking that it was boosted by the rain. As a result Houndoom takes minimal damage and that gives me another Faint Attack. I was expecting Gyarados to set up Rain Dance again, but instead it uses Hyper Beam and does so much damage. Oh, 69 health. Nice. That has happened a lot in this playthrough. I finished Gyarados off, and next is Aerodactyl. Hidden Power Ice is my best choice here because it's super effective, and it gets the Never Melt Ice boost. I was hoping for a one hit, especially because I don't want to get hit by his illegal Rock Slide. Yes, Aerodactyl cannot learn Rock Slide in Generation 2, but somehow Lance's has it. It goes down in a single hit, and from here things are much easier. I sweep through the Dragonites with Hidden Power Ice, Houndoom learns Crunch in the place of Faint Attack, and then Lance sends in his Charizard. It's convenient that I just learned Crunch because I can use it against Charizard now. It does more than half and lowers Charizard's special defense. By the way, that's a 20% chance event. I was scared that Charizard was going to do a lot of damage, but it uses Wing Attack and at first I was like, oh, that's good, that move is trash, it only has 35 base power. But then I realized in Generation 2, Wing Attack has 60 base power. Luckily. Houndoom survives and finishes the Charizard off. Last is his ace Dragonite, and Hidden Power takes care of it in a single hit. Houndoom finishes the league with a time of 1 hour 28 minutes and 14 seconds, with 8 resets at level 52. That's a pretty good time, looks like Houndoom is on course to clock in for a time under 2 hours. Let's see if it can do it. Next, there's a whole bunch of Kanto stuff to do, all of which is very easy for Houndoom. It has a type advantage over Sabrina and Erica. I finish off this short rocket plotline, but I head to Surge next, skipping Misty. Against Brock, Hidden Power is very useful in combination with Crunch. It's good against the two fossils, for instance. It's pretty weird for a move like Crunch to be doing such good damage against rock types. I'm glad that they made this move physical, starting in Generation 4. I finish off Blaine, finally earning myself the badge that boosts Houndoom's fire attacks. Janine is easy, and then I backtrack to face Misty. I'll mention here that Sunny Day is a great fire type move as it shores up fire type's weakness against water while simultaneously boosting fire type damage when the water types resist it. Overall this is just a fantastic move, however weather hasn't been really that good in the late game in Johto in my experience so far, but I've only been trying to use Rain Dance. Maybe Sunny Day is going to prove to be useful in the last two trainers. Of them, the first is Blue. This fight is challenging specifically because of the type diversity on his team. However, Pidgeot is not particularly strong as a lead, so I can take my time here and set up Sunny Day. After all, it loves to use Mirror Move first turn and that means that it does nothing to me. I burn it up with a Sun Boosted Flamethrower and Rhydon comes out next. Here I can use Hidden Power Ice to knock it out. Fun fact, Rock is not actually weak to ice, even though I think a lot of people think that it is. I know I did when I started this channel. However, since the Rhinoceros' special defense is very low, it goes down. Gyarados is next, and here we're probably going to have a Kyogre vs Groudon style weather battle. I use Crunch, Gyarados uses Rain Dance, I use Sunny Day, and Gyarados uses Hydro Pump, but it does about a quarter because of my weather. Okay, I'm starting to see that this move is useful here. I choose Hidden Power to hopefully do less damage so that Blue won't use a full restore. He doesn't, Gyarados sets up Rain again, and then I knock it out with Crunch. I really wanted that order of events because Gyarados then sets up Rain, which is ironic because next Blue chooses to send out Arcanine. The AI uh, obviously does not have a check for the weather, so yeah, 9000 IQ move from him. Just great. However, the AI does look for the best damage range, so it's not going to use any fire moves anyways. It uses extreme speed instead. But it looks like it's only doing about a quarter. My second crunch finishes it off, and because his two final Pokemon are psychic types, I can finish them with Houndoom. And now, I've made it all the way to the Ultimate Generation 2 Challenge. It's time to face Red.
For this fight, I taught Houndoom Detect, which doesn't make any sense at all. I wanted to use it against Pikachu to prevent Charm on the first turn, but like, why would I do that? I'm using special attacks. I don't know what I was thinking. I knock the Pikachu out with Flamethrower, Red sends in Blastoise next because it has a type advantage, and to minimize damage, I go for Sunny Day. Unfortunately, Blastoise is slower. Obviously, it's a turtle, so it gets Rain Dance removing the sun. So I should have gone for Crunch there to get some damage in and then set up on the second turn. After all, Blastoise would have locked itself into a Surf that way. Instead, I go for Detect, stopping Surf's damage, and then I use Sunny Day, minimizing the damage. But it still does almost a third. I use Crunch, hoping for half damage, but it doesn't quite do it. At this point, I wasn't really sure what to do, because even if I make it past the Blastoise, which I do, there's no way that I'm going to be able to outlast the Snorlax. Red taunts me with the possibility of victory by sending out his Espeon next, which is a one-hit, but after that, the Snorlax shrugs off my attack and knocks Houndoom out with Body Slam. So, there's an obvious choice here. I'm going to teach Houndoom Solar Beam. I didn't mention it earlier in the video, but this TM is available just before you get to Victory Road, and I intentionally picked it up when I passed through there on my first time. So, no backtracking required now. It's also great that Houndoom has access to this move, because it really synergizes well with Sunny Day, especially against the Blastoise. However, the turtle still survives. As a result, it removes the sun, and I can't use Solar Beam again. I use Crunch and knock the Blastoise out, as well as the following Espeon. Alright, I managed to get to the Snorlax with green health. That's good. Here's the thing though, <laughs> Snorlax loves to set up with Amnesia on the first turn, which is very awful, especially when running Crunch and Flamethrower. I'm really hoping that Crunch just lowers its special defense, and it does, but then Body Slam does so much damage, and it paralyzes Houndoom. Because my speed is quartered, the Sleepy Bear moves first, and that's my second reset here. I try this fight again, and everything seems pretty stable now with Solar Beam. I can make it back to the Snorlax reliably, and I do have a new strategy here. Instead of using Crunch on the first turn, I can use Flamethrower and hope it burns. This will cut its attack and hopefully give Houndoom better survivability against Body Slam. While Flamethrower does about a third, it doesn't burn, Snorlax uses Body Slam once again, and it gets a Paralysis! Are you kidding me? Rather than using all my rare candies and then saving after that, I've been using my rare candies after I reset. That's so that I can go back and do some training to give Houndoom a few more levels. I'm not sure what I'll need to defeat Red. Let's try the next damage rounding threshold. I reach level 63 and use 10 rare candies, bringing Houndoom to level 73. Okay, let's try it. First question, will Solar Beam 1 hit the Blastoise? The answer is, well, no, it will not. Blastoise sets a brain dance and I decide to use Sunny Day so that it'll have a sun boosted flamethrower against the Snorlax before it uses Amnesia. To get this, I have to tank a Surf. And then I knock the Blastoise out. Crunch 1 hits the Espeon. It did actually survive once before, so hopefully three additional levels have made that consistent. Now it's time for Snorlax. I use Flamethrower because of the sun. It does so much. Actually, it does more than half, so that's really encouraging. I think that I'm going to be able to do it now. The bear uses Body Slam, taking Houndoom down to orange health. Uh, wait, are you kidding me? It paralyzed me again? Three times in a row? Like, seriously? Every fight that I've survived the first hit that it deals to me, it's paralyzed. I, like, what? So, I wonder what happens if he doesn't paralyze me. In the next fight, I use the same strategy, and this time, instead of using Body Slam, Snorlax goes for Amnesia. This raises its special defense. Couldn't you just use Body Slam and not paralyze me? Like, now I have to take it out slowly. Okay, so from this damage range, I don't think that Flamethrower is going to KO the Snorlax. It doesn't, Snorlax body slams, and because it was taken to red health last turn, it doesn't have time to use rest, so I do get to knock it out. Okay, okay, let's do this Houndoom. Charizard's next, and I'm going to have to knock it out over two turns. I hit with Crunch, it doesn't quite do half, ah, it's going to be at three turns. Unless I get a lucky special defense drop. It goes for wing attack, and I was really worried here, but I survive with 11 hit points. My following crunch KOs and red sends in Venusaur. Okay, I really need to one hit. If I don't, I think I've lost. I cross my fingers and I watch the health bar deplete. Like in generation two, they deplete quite slowly. It's, uh, it's definitely not generation four levels of awfulness though. <laughs> Unless I edit the video this way, that is. Okay, let's break the tension because Venusaur goes down. And with that, Houndoom has completed the game. It clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 58 minutes, and 55 seconds, with 12 resets at level 73. And all of this took 7 hours and 3 minutes of game time. The feeling I'm left with at the end of this run is that I was really not satisfied by my consistency against Red. So let's go back and test that right away. 
The first thing I want to know is at what level does Solar Beam 1 hit the Blastoise? To do these tests, I'm going to add rare candies to my inventory and then level up to each level that is a damage rounding threshold, and then I'll test against the Blastoise. So I'll test first at level 75, then 78, then 80, 83, and on. If I had trained in the wild to get these levels, my stats would be slightly higher due to stat experience, but I don't think this is super impactful, especially because of how damage works and how moving over these damage rounding thresholds really has the most impact. Was level 75 enough to give Houndoom the one hit against the Blastoise? Well, not always. I tried this 10 times, and of those attempts, Houndoom only one hit the Blastoise twice. So I think at level 78, it's going to be quite consistent, maybe 8 out of 10 times. Let's see. Unfortunately, my prediction was a bit optimistic. I only one shot the Blastoise 6 out of 10 times, so hopefully level 80 will give me the consistency that I really want. And it does, because at this level, Houndoom one-shots the Blastoise every single time. That's 10 for 10. I'm really satisfied by this. It's going to allow me to go into the fight against Snorlax with Sunny Day set up so that I can hit a very powerful flamethrower right away. But what are my damage ranges against it? With the Sunny Day boosted flamethrower, I'm able to take the Snorlax down to low health. Almost too low, because then it's more likely to use Rest. Also, I can't believe how much Body Slam is paralyzing me. It's so frustrating. I tried using Crunch on the first turn for slightly less damage in the hopes that it wouldn't rest, but this is going to take about four turns to knock it out now, and that doesn't seem like a good idea. It's probably better to just go with Flamethrower and hope that it doesn't use rest, which does occur sometimes. I wanted to mention one more way that I think I could make this fight a little bit better, and that's by using the Miracle Seed to boost my Solar Beam damage against Blastoise. But I don't like that because it doesn't give as much damage against the Snorlax, and that's where I think you really need the damage. Plus, leveling to 80 gives better damage against both Blastoise and Snorlax, so it's a win-win. Well, it's actually a win-win-lose because Houndoom is a slow growth rate Pokemon, so I'm going to have to find a way to get 10 more levels throughout the playthrough. But I think with slightly better planning, I will be able to do that. So here's how I did it in my second playthrough. The first change that I make is to do a lot more training in the early game. This allows the first rival in Cherry Grove City to be much easier. After that, I complete all the trainers on the route heading north to Violet City. And then in Sprout Tower, I finish off all of the sages here. After all, the Bell Sprouts are fast and easy experience. I was hoping that all this training would give me level 13 for Faulkner to be over the next damage rounding threshold, but instead I'm still level 12. To do some extra training, I head northwest of Violet City, and I actually run into a Bellsprout while I was doing this training, which is great because I didn't catch one earlier on, and I only had to fight two wild Pokemon here to get level 13, so that didn't take very much time. Now I'm ready for Faulkner, and level 13 does change this battle a little bit. While it doesn't give me the one hit on the first Pidgey, and I do get hit by a Mudslap, my second Ember still connects and it goes down. Now this is where the difference takes place. Previously I needed three Embers to knock the Pidgeotto out, which made things quite risky, however in this case I only need two. My Berry sustains Houndour a little bit longer, and it gets its second Ember in, knocking the bird out. So that's no resets so far. Obviously the biggest stumbling block in the first playthrough was the rival in Azalea Town, but I'm going to fight every trainer on the way there to hopefully earn Bite as soon as possible. Plus in the previous playthrough, I didn't battle all of the trainers in Bugsy's gym, there was one that I skipped, so I'll fight him this time. I'm starting to learn by doing these challenges with slow growth rate Pokemon in Generation 2 that training in these early portions of the game is so critical, especially because of the rival here in Azalea Town. When I defeat the final trainer in Bugsy's gym, Houndour levels up to level 20 over the damage rounding threshold, and it learns Bite. Obviously, Bugsy isn't an issue, so now it's time to get past the rival. With Bite, I'm not sure that it's even possible to get a reset here. Like, he would have to crit with Water Gun or something. I don't even know. Anyways, I take a very quick victory, so that's no resets moving on to Goldenrod City. After picking up Kenya, I face some of the trainers on the route north. Normally, I try to skip these spinners, but today I just fight them right away because I want levels for Houndour. After all, I want to evolve into a Houndoom before Whitney. And because of how powerful Rollout was last time, and I felt like I got very lucky, I'm going to aim for level 25. And luckily Houndoom just passes this threshold as it defeats the last trainer in Whitney's gym. I get really lucky against her Clefairy because Bite critical hits, and it knocks it out in a single turn. Next is Miltank. And while it is going to try and set up Rollout, at this level, Bite is able to two-hit it, so I don't have to try and mess around with Mud Slap for lowered accuracy or Headbutt for a flinch. So now Whitney is completely consistent. 
With all of these improvements, I'm about five minutes faster than my previous attempt, which I'm really impressed with. Usually the time sort of stacks up by the end of the playthrough, so being this far ahead this early on is a really good sign for Houndoom's overall potential. And nothing in the near future is going to slow it down. After I defeat all of the Kimono Girls, I head to the Lake of Rage and pick up the TM for Hidden Power, and then I backtrack with Abra to Ecritique City. In the Burn Tower, I take care of the rival very easily. Once again, Bite 2 hits the Krokgnaw. Yeah, his team here is just never very good. It feels very similar to the rival in Pokemon Tower in Kanto. After that, I do fight the one optional trainer in Morty's Gym, just for some extra experience. After all, I'm trying to finish the game at level 80 this time, so I do have to do some extra training at some point. Next is Morty, and I don't know what you want me to say about him, he's so easy with Houndoom. It would have been really cool if they provided the player with a bunch of dark types in Burned Tower to teach them that they could use them against ghosts. However, all of these Pokemon are just in the late game, so you don't get to use them. Ah, never gonna stop being frustrated about this. I make my way to Olivine City, fighting some trainers along the way. I'm specifically targeting the trainers that are annoying to skip, or the trainers that I sometimes bump into by accident. Then, if I ever have to go through this portion of the overworld again, I won't be delayed by them. I continue doing this at sea for some additional training, and once I reach the island, I'm going to note that I haven't actually entered any Poké Center since Ecritique City, so I can use Abra to take me all the way back there without losing time to backtracking. After all, I don't want to face Chuck right now. Instead, I'm going to head to the Lake of Rage and start the Rocket Plotline so that I can level up and face Price first. Obviously I'm not going to be changing the order of the gym leaders for this portion of the game, because it just makes sense to do it this way. Price is obviously the easiest for Houndoom to face, and then Jasmine because of her steel types, and finally Chuck. In the Rocket Hideout I fight many of the additional trainers, just to get more levels. After all, I was thinking that it would be really nice to have Flamethrower for Price, however I don't quite make it even after defeating all of the trainers in his gym. Either way, he's still easy to defeat, because he always is, this guy's so bad. Anyways, maybe I can get Flamethrower for Jasmine. To try to level up, I defeat some of the trainers in the lighthouse, but this doesn't give quite enough experience. So I head out to sea and finish off a few more trainers out there to level up and earn Flamethrower. With it, I can easily melt away Jasmine's steel types, and it also helps in Chuck's gym. I defeat the trainers at the start of the gym, which gave me problems last time, and then Chuck himself is even made easier with Flamethrower. It one hits his lead, Primeape, and then against his ace, Polyrath, it actually has the highest effective power of any of my moves. I go for Headbutt turn 1 in case of a flinch, it doesn't get it, Polyrath uses Mind Reader, and then I finish it off with Flamethrower. Alright, so this was all so much more consistent, I still have no resets. And this leads us to the portion of the game that is incredibly boring, the Rocket portion of the game. But this is also a great time to get some of that training in that Houndoom needs for Red. As you may have already noticed, my moveset now contains Faint Attack and Bite. In my previous playthrough, I mentioned that I thought it was a mistake that I gave up Bite because it has a chance to flinch. But in this playthrough, I decided to get both of the attacks instead of something like Mud Slap, because having more PP really makes long grinding sessions like this possible without the assistance of Nurse Joy. I actually make it through the rival in the underground, all the way to the rocket executive at the top of the second portion of Radio Tower, without even having to heal once, so that was really nice. I continue my training out east of Mahogany Town, fighting all of the trainers on this route, and then I fight all of the trainers in Claire's Gym. I teach Houndoom Return just for the Kingdra, and then when it comes out, I accidentally misclick and use Flamethrower. Whoops. It goes for smokescreen, but luckily it misses, and then my second return gets a critical hit. So uh, that's skill going one way and luck going the other way. Thank you game, I really appreciate it. After that, I finish off her following two Dragonairs with Hidden Power Ice, and that's it. I've earned myself all of the Johto badges. At this point in the run, all of the training I've been doing has actually made the two times become even with each other. While I am going into the league 4 levels higher, which is nice, my goal was to finish 10 levels higher, and this is starting to feel like an impossibility. I think I might need to face red at level 75, just for the increased chance that Solar Beam 1 hits, but I don't think it's going to be possible to finish at level 80 like I originally intended, while also finishing with less real time. At least in this case, leveling up earlier has given me crunch for Will, and that makes him so trivial. After that, I don't make any mistakes on Koga, and I take him out on my first attempt as well. Now, it's time for Bruno, who usually I make fun of in Kanto, but today, he's a serious threat. Previously, I made it past his Machamp because of luck, and I'm gonna actually need some luck this time as well. 
The problem here is that Flamethrower, when boosted by Sunny Day, doesn't have enough damage to knock the Machamp out consistently, so he gets a chance to use Cross Chop. Unfortunately, it knocks me out in my first fight against him, and then in the second fight, it scores a critical hit and knocks Houndoom out again. So that's my first two resets against Bruno of all people. At least in my third attempt, it doesn't get a critical hit, Houndoom survives, and then Burn knocks it out. Against Karen, I set up Sunny Day on the first turn, and then she's actually quite an easy sweep. The only problem here would have been getting hit by Sand Attack, but in this case it misses. Because I'm at a higher level now, when her Houndoom finally comes out, I'm able to take it out in two hits instead of three like last time. All that's left of the leak is Lance, and honestly, he's sort of a pushover for Houndoom. With Lance out of the way, I now have to make the boring journey through Kanto. I didn't make very many changes to my rooting this time, but I made one significant change once I reach Misty. Instead of waiting until Red to teach Solar Beam, I can teach it to Houndoom now. After all, the synergy between Sunny Day being a fire type and being able to use Solar Beam is really great. Sunny Day reduces the damage from water so that I take less from the super effective attacks. After that, I have a 120 base power move that I can use to take out her entire team. And the benefits of Solar Beam don't end here, because against Blue, when Rhydon comes out, it takes four times damage from Solar Beam. So yeah, it doesn't last very long. The only Pokemon that actually is a threat is the Arcanine, but because the Gyarados sets up Rain Dance, it just uses extreme speed, and while it does do a lot of damage with a critical hit from an extreme speed, after it goes down, he only has two Psychic types remaining, and Crunch makes quick work of both of them. So Houndoom's made it all the way back to red, and all the additional training that I put in has raised it 5 levels. So I'm level 75 after using all my rare candies. Will this be enough? Let's see. Pikachu's first, I set up Sunny Day, and then it misses a charm which is great, however it does go for Quick Attack next turn which isn't great. I knock it out and move on to the Blastoise that is next. Okay Solar Beam, please do it. And it does. Blastoise goes down, next is Espeon, and I knock it out with Crunch. Up next is Snorlax. I go for a flamethrower, it does a lot of damage, but the Sleepy Bear retaliates with a body slam and paralyzes Houndoom. Okay, that's probably the worst case scenario in this fight. Because of the status, I end up going down. Because this is a follow-up playthrough, I strategized intelligently and saved after using my rare candies, because I know this is the strategy that I'm going to end up going for. I knock the Pikachu out, Blastoise comes out, and I go for Solar Beam, but this time it doesn't get the KO. So I have to knock it out on the next turn, and that means it gets Rain Dance set up before Espeon comes out. However, this isn't the end of the world, because I can actually just set up Sunny Day here. Espeon goes for Reflect, which is meaningless because my Houndoom has no physical moves. Remember, all Dark type attacks are special in Generation 2. On the next turn, I knock it out with Crunch and move on to the Snorlax. My first flamethrower does more than half, it raises its special defense with amnesia, and then I go for a follow-up crunch, which in a lucky turn of events gets a critical hit and knocks it out. Okay, so I've pretty much done it now. I take Charizard out in two turns with crunch, and Venusaur is all that's left. Flamethrower burns it up, and that's it. Houndoom has done it. It beat the game in 1 hour, 49 minutes, and 18 seconds, with 3 resets at level 75. This took exactly 7 hours of game time. Honestly, I'm really happy with these results from Houndoom. It is an exceptional Pokemon. I was able to improve 3 of the metrics and clock in under an hour and 50 minutes. So now let's rank Houndoom in my Generation 2 tier list. It didn't achieve results anywhere near Ho-Oh and Lugia's times, and Ampharos was also more than 10 minutes faster than it. Its time is most comparable to Octillery, which it still outperformed, and I think it was more consistent then, especially against Red. So for today, it earns a spot in the B tier, shuffling everyone else down a tier as a result. A lot of you mentioned in my last Johto video, which was Smeargle, that you had concerns with where I placed it after how well Smeargle ended up doing. By the way, if you haven't seen that video, check it out. It is absolutely mind-blowing what that thing can do with its stats. Yeah, they're, they're terrible stats. Anyways, my tier lists are always ranking Pokemon based on the real-time completion that I got with them, not based on how the Pokemon performs in comparison with the expectations. For Smeargle, it has had a relatively slow finish when compared to the other Pokemon in this tier list. However, it dramatically exceeded my expectations because I expected it to be so much slower. It's inevitable that as I play the game with more Pokemon, all of these rankings will shuffle around as new results enter the playing field. 
Right now, I'm just trying to spread things out as much as possible, so that's why certain Pokemon are in the tiers they're in right now. Like, subscribe, ring the Chimeco, and comment because I gotta read them all. Thanks to all my patrons for their support. If you made it this far, you're incredible. Now, it's bloopers time. Today, I'm going to start with Houndour and evolve it throughout the playthrough to make things as hard as possible on myself. I replace Cyndaquil with the rival so that he picks Toted... Uh, not, that's not what I do. <laughs> I don't replace the rival with uh, Cyndaquil. Although, it would still have red hair, I guess. It's like flames, but... But then, it just crits with Water Gun and takes Houndour down to... But then it just crits with Water Gun and takes Houndour down to level 11. No. No, it does not. <laughs> it does not level me down with its attack. Imagine that. Imagine a Pokemon game where if you get hit by a move, you get leveled down. <laughs> that would be wild. I'd probably do that with Game Hook. Holy. This is like the one area in Johto where it feels like the experience yield, yields, 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 yes. Next is Croknaw. Rex is, Rex is Croknaw, yes. You'd think that maybe once you defeat the Elite Four, they'd give you a bark, a bark boost. Yes, yes, that one. That's what Houndoom actually needs. It needs a bark boost. Then its roar becomes a damage dealing move. Prime Mip is first. I choose Headbutch. Headbutch. Yeah, ah, no! <laughs> Headbutch. Oh, I butchered that line. Kind of sounds like butch. <laughs> butch. Butch is a funny word. Does that mean anything? I hope it doesn't mean something really offensive. We gotta look it up. Butch. No, see, I typed in butch and then it just said, like, butcher. No, no, no. Butch. No. It, it searched up butch. But I don't want butch. I mean butch. Like, like, how do we make it the like, two U's? How do we turn it into butch? Uh, we can't. Ha! <laughs> it's not a word. At least not with that pronunciation. Flame flower. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what did I do there? I just like lost it. Holy. After you defeat the rockets in Radio Tower, one of the people gives you the TM for Sunny Day. So I figured that teaching it here to sun uh, sound doom, yes. And then, because Houndoom is faster, I can use Sunny Day to remove the remain. Re the remain, yes. Ha! <laughs> Gyarados sets up Rain Dance, and then, because Houndoom is faster, I can use Sunny Day to remove the rain and additionally cut. Cut! Ah! Gyarados sets up Rain Dance, and then, because Houndoom is faster, I can use Sunny Day to remove the remain. The remain. I said it again. I can't believe it. Come on! Ah! Uh, what am I doing? 